Hey, this is Sayyam Bhutani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science, a podcast for data science enthusiasts where I interview practitioners, researchers and cacklers about their journey, experience and talk all things about data science. Hello and welcome to the 27th episode of Chai Time Data Science. If you were from the Fast A family, you'll recognize why 27 is an important number to me. And I'm really, really honored to be finally releasing my interview with my guru and the guru to the complete Fast AI community, Jeremy Howard, co-founder of Fast AI. In this interview, we talk all about Jeremy's journey from university to consulting, founding two software companies followed by becoming number one on Kaggle and invest, eventually investing into Kaggle. We, of course, talk more about FastAI. The conversation should also give you an insight of how the team works, how do they collaborate, and how is the search at fast.ai done, how the course has evolved over time. It's really a huge honor for me to be able to share this interview. So thank you so much, Jeremy, for helping make this happen. and. Along with a quick note to the viewers and listeners, uh, thanks to your comments from now on, all of the episodes will include timestamps to the parts of the conversation in the description of the podcast or on comments on YouTube. So please feel free to find them if you're interested. Thanks to the complete community for sending all of the amazing questions on the AMA thread. For now, here's the conversation. Please enjoy the show. Hi everyone, it's, it's uh, a huge honor for me to be talking to my biggest machine learning hero and the machine learning hero for the complete Fast.ai community, co-founder of Fast.ai and my guru, Jeremy Howard. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you for having me. So I think you've had one of the most unique paths to becoming a researcher, programmer, founder, data scientist, and now a global teacher. Can you confirm or, deny, confirm or deny if you studied programming at university? Uh, what course did you take? Uh, I did not study programming at university. <laughs> I studied philosophy at university. So uh, at, at that time, you also started working at McKinsey as a business uh, consultant. Uh, you were one right. of the three worldwide analytical specialists. Could you right. tell us about your journey there? Sure. I mean, um, it was a bit random. Uh, I <clears throat> so I was I was studying at the University of Melbourne, and I needed money, so I was <laughs> looking for a holiday job. And uh, there was a one day a week kind of uh, junior IT helper job advertised, which the company didn't say what company it was. It was just uh, advertised on the university jobs board and I applied to it. And this guy rings me up during the summer and said, you know, do you want to come in and do an interview? Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, okay. And then uh, I was like, where, whereabouts? Where, what company is it? He's like, oh, it's <laughs> called McKinsey and Company. And I'm like, McKinsey and Company? You mean the McKinsey and Company? And he's like, oh, yeah. Like, oh, okay, absolutely. I'll be right there. So uh, I did an interview and I got this one day a week job, uh, IT junior thing. And um, I guess the funny thing was at that time, so this is uh, 20 years ago, uh, mm -hmm. Oh, more than that, 27 years ago, goodness me. Um, <laughs> and uh, at that time, people didn't generally have great PC skills. And also kind of at the management consulting firms, everybody had much the same background. They'd all like done basically Stanford or Wharton MBAs. Um, so I found when I was doing my one day a week, and I'd help people, I don't know, clean their keyboard when they spilt Coke into it or <laughs> forgot their password or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, I would always ask them what they were doing, you know, and they would tell me and show me and I'd be like, oh, 
why don't you use this other feature of Microsoft Excel or why don't you use you know a SQL database for that or whatever you know access in practice and uh, people found it super helpful because I knew how to use you know <laughs> personal computer software better than they did um, so it kind of pretty quickly there was this queue out the door every time I came to work every Friday of people wanting <laughs> tips on how to solve their problem with this with computers basically yeah so one day a week became two days a week became three days a week and yeah you know within a few months they had offered me a full-time job doing this thing whatever it is I was doing <laughs> while you were pain. still in university yeah when I just started actually pretty much um, and so that was like taking me 90 hours a week the job so it didn't take, leave me any time to study, but the job was much more interesting than anything that happened at university anyway. So what I ended up doing was I just turned up to exams. I would take two weeks off mm -hmm. um, uh, at McKinsey before each exams, and I would study for the exams and find out what assignments I was meant to have done and plead with the professor to let me turn them in two months <laughs> late. You know, Somehow they always did. Um, and it worked out great because... Um, you know, I was invited in the end to to work on the project team, sitting on site and getting flown around the place and fancy hotels and whatever else. And as an eighteen-year-old, <laughs> it all felt very exciting, you know. And I I wanted to learn about business, so it was a good opportunity to you know badger the consultants to ask them about my business strategy and stuff and yeah it was it was good okay so you also worked on uh, as as i found online optimization models statistical analysis and you developed data models can can we sort of link that to what we call machine learning now was it similar oh yeah absolutely i mean it was all data analysis it was all data science so i actually after a couple of <clears throat> a couple of years i moved to kind of the other big management consulting firm being at carney carney and mckinsey started at the same time, uh, they were partners mm -hmm. originally. Um, and at AT Kearney, I actually helped found a, a new global practice, which we called leveraging customer information. And that global practice was all about, you know, was what today we would call big data. It was basically trying to convince companies that data was a valuable asset and that they should think about putting it in like a data warehouse. And uh, I ran, yeah, believe it or not, I was running courses in- Okay you know, logistic regression and linear programming and whatever for AT Kearney's clients. And then what I would do is I would take the people that did well on those courses and we would do projects with them to like, I don't know, try and drive value within the business, so kind of a sort of joint project between AT Kearney and people, you know, within the company, within the client, <clears throat> where it was kind of both a learning exercise as well as an actual you know, project. So, got it. Yeah, and you know, I I built a, I helped build a, a program for AT Kearney globally for education for teaching all the AT Kearney consultants to use pivot tables and okay. access and you know stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> we played around a little bit with neural networks. Um, in the early two thousands. Sorry. Uh, this was in the early two thousands. Uh, no, this would be in the mid 90s okay um early to mid 90s um uh so we but we mainly did stuff with decision trees in those days so okay. when random forests appeared in like 1999 that was very exciting because it was like i knew that decision trees had problems mm -hmm. <clears throat> um and kind of random forests largely solved them which was great so uh, this was uh, during this period, uh, was it the case that you picked up programming skills uh, while working on them or when did you start your programming career, so to speak? Yeah, good question. So I had a, I had a Commodore 64 computer at home okay. growing up and I did. I've my, never seen one of those. <laughs> yeah. So it's like 64K of memory and it, you know, you, when you turn it on, you get a prompt where you can type in basic commands basically. So I did like, 
a tiny bit of programming, tiny, tiny, tiny bit of programming at high school, just learnt from from a book. Because um, when my mum gave me this computer, she didn't know about software, so she didn't buy any <laughs> software. And you couldn't download it, obviously. So I, yeah. the only stuff I could do with the computer was stuff I programmed myself. So, um, so I had to learn a little bit. And then, you know, the, uh, did a lot more programming once I started doing this consulting kind of stuff because I started using Visual Basic for applications a lot with um, Excel and Access. Mm -hmm. And that was great because it was like very applied, very tangible, like everything was like solving a real problem for people who needed it right away. Yep. But I didn't really learn like software engineering until like 1999 when I wanted to create Fastmail because before that everything I'd built, it was only for me. It was really like, I mean, other people were using it, but no, I wasn't, nobody else was coding it with me. It would like, it would be a one-off thing I'd build for some project and then it'd be thrown away. I didn't really have to extend it. So things like using symbols instead of magic strings or, you know, how to like structure things in maintainable ways. I didn't learn any of that stuff really until mm -hmm. I started working on Fastmail. What uh, led you to being from, uh, as the internet calls you, wonder kid consultant uh, to your journey as a founder? So what led you to founding Fastmail? Uh, well, along with I kind of always wanted to do my own thing. Um, and so like my one, my one regret really in my career is I spent too long in consulting. I was there for eight years, I think. Um, and my original plan was to do two years which okay. would have been perfect, you know. The issue was, a, um, it felt like it felt like I had a lot to learn from the other consultants about business and stuff, and because mm -hmm. I never quite understood what they were saying. <clears throat> but in hindsight, that wasn't true. In hindsight, they just didn't they didn't understand <laughs> where business was going. Like when we talked about stuff like the internet and they were trying to explain to me why the internet wouldn't be very important and I should forget about it. Um, and I felt like I wasn't understanding what they were saying and I had a lot more to learn, but um, that wasn't really what happened. So, mm -hmm. you know, and also I just got caught up in the rat race of like being successful at the big consulting firms seemed useful of itself, like a good goal for somebody who wants to like, I don't know, felt like getting good grades or something, but actually it was a waste of time. <laughs> Uh, but now you've almost fully recovered, so that's okay. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. So, but anyway, it was a, it, it, it wasted a lot of time, and um, I always wanted to do my own thing. And I guess part of it is it's hard when you want to do your own thing, is you're looking for the perfect thing, and there is no perfect thing. So, um, so I, and the other thing is I kind of heard that starting a, a small business probability of failure was really high. So I kind of did something a bit weird, which is I started two at the same time, thinking that would you know, increase the chances. <laughs> which again, it was kind of based on a, a faulty premise because actually your probability of success is quite high if you do things properly. It's not stochastic. It's entirely, almost entirely up to you as yeah. to whether you're successful. So anyway, yeah. So, I, um, so one of the things was a insurance pricing optimization company um, called Optimal Decisions, which, um, you know, came pretty directly out of ideas that I developed while I was helping insurance clients. And I kind of thought, wow, it's really weird that nobody's using optimization methods in this industry for pricing. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was Fastmail, which I'm not sure I really intended it as a company originally. Originally, it was just like, gosh, I hate how all of the email systems are crappy. It was basically Yahoo or Hotmail <laughs> at that time. Back so in the I, 2000s, I, I think. Yeah, well, that was 1999 again. Yeah, so um, so I thought I'd, I'd build my own that would be better than theirs, and then at least I have something that I like. Um, so, I, yeah, I basically started doing those two things at about the same time. Got it. So uh, what I'm able to understand is since since the beginning, you always had a practical approach to all of the problems, something something that you even teach right now at Fast A. Yeah, right. I mean, that's just me. I, um, I, I, I struggle with pointless abstractions or solving pointless problems. I mean, it's nice. There's some 
fun puzzles to solve or whatever, but in the end, I want to spend my time you know, helping somebody do something useful <laughs> um, <laughs> and and also doing it in a very data driven way is something I've always uh, yeah, I've always found works well. Okay. So when did Kaggle uh, start to come into the picture for you in, in an online, sp- online piece of information? I found that it was like a walk in the park situation for you where you ended up winning a sprint race against gold medalist in your first competition. Yeah, that was really, really, really weird for me. Um, Cause I, th- <clears throat> so I, I ran fast mail and optimal decisions for about, about 10 years and sold them. And, and these were in technical rules. Uh, so I, I, I founded both of those companies. Okay. So I was kind of, we didn't exactly have titles, but <laughs> um, yeah. I was basically running or co-running those companies. Um, so yeah, so fast mail, it was with a one guy called Rob and the two of us just ran everything. We didn't, you know, I guess I played more of a CEO role and he played more of a CTO role, but we didn't, you know, we didn't have titles. We didn't worry too much about it. Um, mm-hmm. And Optimal Decisions, there was with two other guys I did that with. And again, we we ran it together and built it together. So, you know, all the usual stuff, hiring and, um, you know, sales and yeah. product and blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I tended to... Um, have more of the product vision stuff and all of these things. Like both of those companies were companies that I kind of decided to start and had the original vision for. Yeah. Um, Rob joined Fastmail a few months after it started, for instance. Um, although he had much deeper technical expertise at that time than I did. So he made the code a lot better. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so anyway, so I... Um, I thought of myself as a manager and a business guy, like because I've Got never it. done any technical courses, either in coding or in math. Or so I felt very um, uh, not just insecure about my technical skills, but confident that they were not good. Um, okay. And and especially since I'd spent all these years kind of managing these companies, I did some coding, but it got less and less over time, and um, yeah, so after selling the second of them, I just had all this time on my hands <laughs> and didn't know what to do with myself. And I kind of felt like, oh, it would be nice to be to become better at like machine learning and stuff. So mm-hmm. um, I used SPSS and R, sorry, not SPSS, um, S plus and R for a long time, S plus being the kind of commercial predecessor in some ways of R for quite a long time at optimal decisions. Um, Although, you know, uh, only in as much as the amount of time I could spend when I was doing a lot of management stuff. And I kind of thought it was okay, but I didn't feel like I was very good at it. So I joined um, an R meetup in Melbourne with the hope I could, you know, kind of find ways to meet people that knew more about it than I did and get better at it. Yeah. And at that, so the first R meetup I went to, I guess, Kaggle had just started. Mm-hmm. So it was basically one guy who had done that and somebody told me about this thing called Kaggle. So I was in Melbourne and Kaggle came out of Melbourne and they were like, oh, there's this thing called Kaggle that runs competitions and that's a good way to learn more R because you could use R to enter a competition and, um, I thought, oh, that's cool. So um, I emailed the meetup group and said, like, hey, does anybody want to form a team for this competition? Yeah. And I guess what I've found again and again tends to happen is when you say something like that, dozens of people will email back and say, yes, I'd like to be on a team, but no one does anything. That's still the case. I can confirm that. (laughs) Very, very, very much. Everybody wants to be on the team, but no one does anything. So lots of people kind of said, yeah, I'd like to be on the team. And then I'd start like, I started just doing things, um, Mm -hmm. this competition and nobody else seemed to be doing anything. So I didn't end up having a team at all. And I didn't even end up using R because I kind of, I, I was, 
pretty good at uh, C sharp. You know, that was the thing I was most comfortable with and I liked. Um, so I used, uh, uh, as a time series competition, so I used C sharp to kind of create lots of plots of all these different time series and I kind of looked at them and I looked for patterns and I, I'd never done anything with time series, so I kind of, kind of why I picked this competition because I was just trying to learn, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wasn't really sure about putting an actual submission in because that seemed very intimidating. Okay. Um, and I was worried that I'd probably be last and that would be embarrassing. Uh, but I kind of thought, well, I should try, you know, and if I'm last, I'm last, so be it. Um, so I kind of entered with my real name to kind of maximize the <laughs> pressure on myself to like do my best I could. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't, you know, I, I was surprised I was only like halfway down the leaderboard. I wasn't right at the very bottom. So that was good. Um, kind of put an early entry in. And when I looked at the people that were in the top 10, they were all like PhDs and professors and stuff. And so I thought, okay, well, at the very least, I'll learn from them at the end of the competition to see what they do. Yeah. And I guess, yeah, it was weird. Like I just spent a bit of time on it each day and just came up with simple, more simple common sense things to try. And each time, well, a lot of them didn't work, obviously, but some of them did put me a bit mm -hmm. higher and a bit higher. And yeah, by the end of it, um, I found, I did find somebody to team up with. Um, and uh, and yeah, we, we won the competition. And that like uh, totally changed my mindset about both my own skills and about like, I don't know, the lay of the land. I, I yeah. had always thought like there were PhDs who were like somewhere way up there in the stratosphere, genius, geniuses <laughs> who I could never understand. And I suddenly is like, oh, actually just by using a bit of, like I didn't read any papers or anything. I just used common sense. It's like, oh, you know, with a bit of common sense, yeah. that's actually all this is. Like all that stuff I'd been doing in business and whatever, of just trying to find common sense solutions to things. That's that's all this stuff is. It's not <laughs> it's not some weird magic, you know. And I also thought like, oh, and I'm I've actually found something I'm apparently good at, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so so that was nice. I felt like okay, I should I should focus on on that because that's that's apparently a skill that I accidentally <laughs> have developed, and I'm. I guess I probably do it differently to other people because I have a different background. Um, yeah. So let's see where that takes us. So that's that's kind of been my focus ever since. And you eventually, uh, you I believe, got hooked to the Kaggle system, as we Kagglers call it. Uh, you ended up becoming number one uh, in the rankings and also a grandmaster. Yeah. So yeah. So I um, I think it was. The second competition I entered was for the international chess ratings body and um, basically trying to find a better way of doing ratings. And mm -hmm. I uh, came across this interesting uh, true skill through time approach, which was something that was developed at Microsoft Research. And one of the interesting things there was um, not only, not only was it a cool technique, but their research code was in F sharp. And okay. I really like F sharp. And I also know that's something that pretty much nobody in data science understands. And so I thought like probably nobody else is going to know even how to use this code. Um, <laughs> so I kind of picked it up and modified it and got into it and realized this was a super powerful approach for ranking systems. And I ended up coming second in this competition, largely through just leveraging this true, true, true skill through time approach and a little bit of pre-processing, a little bit of post-processing, a little bit of hyper-parameter tuning. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the guy who came first and I were like super, super close. You know, I was a little bit better on the public and he was a little bit better on the private. And so it was like super fun, kind of, mm -hmm. I don't know, just a competition experience. And then I think it was my third competition was predicting grant application success uh, for university grants, uh, research grants. Yeah. And 
for that one, I again, I used C-sharp. And that was kind of fun because it was this kind of relational data. And I had done a lot of work with relational data. And so I built this C-sharp library to basically auto-generate all kinds of different features and aggregations for the relational data. Um, and just dumped it into my favorite tool, which is a random forest. Yeah. Um, favorite tool at that time anyway. Uh, and I ended up winning that partly because I came, I noticed a data leakage issue, which okay. although it's like not very helpful for the organizers, it's <laughs> super fun actually as a competitor, yeah. thinking of all the kinds of leakage that you might be able to find and finding ways to test them out. So, yeah, I mean, I, um, I really, you know, found, you know, uh, uh, so I kind of like done super well in three competitions in a row. And at that point on Kaggle, nobody else had got anywhere close to that. So I like, not mm -hmm. only was I number one, but I was number one by like, miles. And yeah. I thought like, oh yeah, this is super exciting, you know, uh, to be doing something that I'm interested in and I'm learning a lot and I'm getting better at it. And, um, uh, good community so yeah that was fun got it and during that period you were also invited to join the team you also i believe saw a lot in their vision because you were one of the first angel investors in kaggle yeah so mm -hmm. me and another guy became the first angel investors and um but then uh as more people started using it it got started getting really slow mm -hmm. and i was like oh that's weird because it's still not like by any stretch a high traffic site if you compared it to something like fastmail um, which i had been working on previously which had a million users using it all the time because people are always okay. looking at email you know yeah. this was a small number of thousands of users at most and i don't know putting in like one submission a day or something it just made so no no sense it was so slow so i asked to look at the code and when I did, I was kind of like, oh, no wonder it's so slow. Like there was no indexes and on any of the tables. The whole thing was just not, you know, well optimized. Mm -hmm. And it was written in PHP and it was kind of like, um, didn't feel very scalable. And I kind of thought, oh, that's, as an investor, I felt worried <laughs> that, <Okay. laughs> that there was a kind of a technical problem here. So I volunteered to rewrite the whole thing. And so I started out by creating a, a new database for it from scratch. And then I started rewriting the whole thing to .NET. Um, and um, we found a guy who was also a great .NET programmer. So we ended up kind of doing that together. But it was all like just an informal volunteer thing. Got um, but by the end of that, you know, I think it was running on like three AWS servers. And it was basically fully loaded and we went okay. down to using one server like one percent load it just it was like okay that's 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 good now we can scale from there after that uh, you again went back to a founder role uh, this time in machine learning and the intersection of medical space uh, at analytic so did uh, did you have any background again in medical domain during that time and machine learning no no i certainly didn't um yeah, so at Kaggle, you know, I ended up becoming an equal partner in the company and, you know, we got funding for it and I came to San Francisco to help develop it. Um, but yeah, I mean, one of the things that happened around 2011 was I started seeing deep learning uh, doing super well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I always said to myself, since my kind of early 20s, when I saw the, the promise of neural nets, that like one day neural nets will start becoming the state of the art at things because they just, they, they just make so much sense, you know? Yeah. Um, and I kind of kept on checking in from time to time to see if that was happening and it wasn't and it wasn't and it wasn't. And then suddenly it was. Um, mainly it's like the work that Dan Sirison was doing in Jürgen Spithuber's lab um, was like literally surpassing human performance, at traffic yeah. sign recognition. So uh, I felt, yeah, that just like the kinds of problems that were coming to Kaggle weren't even the right problems to, to demonstrate what was happening here. They were generally like tabular time series kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it just didn't feel like that was going to 
really leverage the promise here. So I actually spent a whole year um, doing nothing but researching deep learning application opportunities. Um, so I went around and interviewed lots of people and visited lots of companies and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, I came to the conclusion that the biggest opportunity for societal impact was in medicine. And I cared a lot about societal impact because I felt like all that time I'd spent in consulting and on fast mail and on optimal decisions hadn't really had a very significant positive societal impact. And that just mm -hmm. felt like such a sad waste of two decades. Um, just it seemed, I just felt pretty stupid for spending all this time doing stuff that wasn't really making much of a difference to the world. So yeah, super excited to find out that medicine, you know, a lot of diagnostic medicine and a lot of treatment planning could have could be boiled down to a kind of data analysis. Mm -hmm. And the kind of data analysis that I thought deep learning could be pretty good at. So yeah, decided to start this company called Analytic to focus on seeing what we could do there. Um, and in particular, because there's about a 10x shortage of doctors in the developing world. So like yeah. people are dying because they don't have access to medicine um, or to doctors to you know find out what's wrong with them. Um, so yeah, um, started in Lydic to see what, what we could do, got amazingly good outcomes very quickly, but that was very, um, very, very intimidating to get into a field about, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't have any family that are doctors. I, it felt very um, exclusive and inaccessible and it is, you know? Yep. So um, that was, that was a very difficult thing to try to get into, but it felt really important. And I felt like if I could show some success and equally importantly, get some publicity that mm -hmm. people would take notice. And if they did, then people would start to invest in this. And then if people invested in this, you know, maybe maybe the promise of deep learning and medicine could start to be seen. Right. What's your perspective on the current state of um, machine learning, broadly speaking, in the medical domain? Well, it's, you know, it's very early. Um, I would say like, <clears throat> what we did at Twitter made a real difference there. Like it's, it's, it's gone from being entirely ignored. Like at that time, it was the first organization to focus on deep learning and medicine. Yeah. There was basically no, almost no academic papers that were discussing it. Um, it was totally, yeah, the, it just didn't really exist as a, as an area of interest. Um, now it's, it's huge. It's huge. You know, there's a whole journal about it and, um, you know, you can see a very direct lineage from the work we did at Analytic to the stuff that's now happening. Like a lot of the other early companies that jumped into this who I met at conferences and stuff would come up to me and said, thank you for starting Analytic. It's because of that that we started this. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's really, really, really nice to see. Um, but it's but still in the research phase, so to speak, rather than yeah, the Yeah, but it's still, it's still very early days. Um, there's, there's very, 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 very little clinical application going on. There is some in China, uh, but you're not generally going to hear about it because yeah. it's, it's happening within organizations who have no reason to want to trumpet what they're doing and every reason to keep it quiet. Um, my, you know, I thought some of the biggest opportunities were in um, things like teleradiology. And I saw that just yesterday, a company was announced that's going to combine teleradiology and AI. So kind of, it's taken a very long time. These mm -hmm. things take a very, very long time. But uh, it's, it's, it's happening. You know, it's happening slowly. And there's certainly plenty of money, plenty of interest. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it will happen. Got it. Now, uh, coming to uh, how you uh, how you found it fast, it was through the frustrations and the general lack of good materials, uh, as I found online. Did you envision fast getting to the stage it is currently at in terms of how you've enabled uh, everyone to make deep learning uncool? Or it's, is it 
is there still a gap in your vision i mean oh there's still a gap in my vision but i mean at the same time it's still be you know beyond my wildest dreams of what we could have achieved i mean i i guess if you'd push me to say like what's the best you could possibly hope for i could have sketched out something roughly like this <laughs> um, but yeah i mean part of the issue was you know at at analytic we could just do one small piece of one small piece yep. and i i knew that to really harness this tool for societal benefit would require a lot more people and specifically a lot more domain experts who understood mm -hmm. their fields you know whether whatever it, you know whether it be journalism or neurology or legal or whatever so um so really that's where fast ai came out of was was wanting to have a kind of higher leverage impact than just working in one field particularly when we saw how it was possible to kind of do a lot in one field quite mm -hmm. quickly um so yeah so the kind of the thought was okay if we're going to let anybody be able to leverage deep learning to help them with whatever it is they're they're passionate about whatever they care about step one is to see what we can do what people can do right now you know yep. what is the current state of the technology and teach people how to use it so so we decided to start out by focusing on education um and we thought like yeah once we do that for a while we'll see where the gaps are um and then we can start doing kind of research and development to fill in those gaps so that people with less background can get better and better results so at this point we're still failing in the like at this point um we still require a year of coding before you do anything on fast ai which is mm -hmm. excludes the vast majority of humanity yeah um i mean anybody could spend a year learning to code but it's it's a it's a big obstacle um so that's so we still got a long way to go but at the same time uh we certainly have seen a lot 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 of people who with no particular math background um certainly no machine learning background are solving societally important problems with the benefit of deep learning and with their own domain expertise um so we're certainly making progress did you always enjoy the role of being an educator so you mentioned even during your early days you had uh, cooked up some tutorials was that always something you enjoyed or again something that you had to pick up for your vision um i don't know if i enjoy it or have ever enjoyed it like it's <laughs> it's very scary like i do find it terrifying to to prepare something where before i start preparing it i'm like i i don't <laughs> understand this nearly well enough and maybe i never will um because so there's I, always that mm. sorry i definitely speak as as a part of the fast ai community as a whole and now that i've graduated i can officially say that that you've been a better much much better professor than all of the courses i've taken oh so, thank you <laughs> i mean uh, somehow no matter how many times i successfully navigate some topic area and get to a point that i can teach it there's always this large part of my brain that when i start on something new tells me that i won't be able to do this one that this one will be beyond me um so that's kind of scary and so the preparation is scary and then the teaching itself is scary because it's like they have to get up there and <laughs> try to make sense of this thing in real time um thousands of people but, watching in person yeah online. absolutely but then having done it it's a good feeling to like have it in the bag and be like okay people people are using this and getting stuff out of it so i think um i think i'm <clears throat> for a lot of people i'm a i'm a good teacher because i don't have the traditional technical background where i've 
patiently gone through the foundations and built stuff on top of them and like you know only a very small subset of the world go through that formal process until they get their phd or whatever and then they start teaching and then they're all going to teach that way because that's how they learned um or else i guess i'm part of a small but increasingly large group of people who the top down approach people yeah didn't do any of that more just like okay i want to do something how do i do the thing you know oh, oh turns out i need to learn about this other thing now i need to learn about this other thing um but it does mean i yeah um very much understand the thought process of trying to understand uh, you know trying to understand the topic um and the desire to not spend 10 years getting <laughs> to that point <laughs> um so yeah uh, i also like i like most people i'm pretty visual in terms of like how i think about things and again like most teaching of most technical topics isn't very visual it tends to be very based on you know i can officially agree, agree to that because i am out of college i have received my degree so i can agree to that <laughs> <laughs> yeah um uh, so again you know you get this really biased sample of people who have been through that process are comfortable with it and are happy to teach that way and so you get this very weird biased kind of subset of humanity that does most technical teaching in a way that doesn't suit most of humanity yeah so uh, can you tell us what amounts amounts of efforts go into the course when we don't get to see you live because to me fast is like this amazing movie which has a sequel that's always better than the previous part so how, how do you do that how have you rerun the course over and over rewritten the library for the third I time i mean it's a it's a full time job right so there's 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 four things as you know that we do being teaching research development community um i will say the community increasingly is looking after itself which is nice but you know yeah. especially thanks to folks like you um who put a lot of effort into it um the other three definitely don't the you know the research uh directly leads into the development the development directly leads in you know nowadays into the courses so for one course <clears throat> which takes 7 weeks um twice generally twice a year all the other time is being spent basically preparing the stuff for the next course um so it's you know and even that never feels like enough because we want to um you know we want to show you the best way to do x for all x where you know for all kind of interesting x um and the field moves very quickly and the you know part of the issue is also on the development side we never really had the time to make our software really really good like it was always mm-hmm. building something just enough for the next course kind of a thing um so we never had the time to step back and say like what's the absolute best way we could do this um for the so audience yeah, i'd like to mention yeah. that it was just the three core contributors uh jeremy rachel and silvain at the core now it's slightly larger but again it was just these three people working on the library yeah and you know rachel doesn't really work on it anymore because she started her uh, job as the director of the um center for applied data ethics so it's yeah 99% is is me and silvain yeah So uh can you tell us more about how do you approach research because I know you're very critical of most of the research that's being done today what questions do you ask what uh things are interesting to you Well um for us it's always starting with a problem that we're trying to fix So normally in academia you would start with like oh what's a way I think I can get something published <laughs> that's your question right published and gets citations and so that means picking a um a a problem which everybody else is already working on because that's what gets published and that's also what gets cited try to build a significant but not too big increment on, on top of the current approaches so that everybody involved in that field will understand that and they'll be able to cite that on their increment on your work 
Um, so that the whole process of, you know, most academic research is, is kind of by definition skewed towards uh, incremental evolution without too much bold rethinking of basic ideas. Yeah. In theory, um, kind of tenured professors should be able to jump out of that. You know, that's kind of part of why that's there. But in practice, mm -hmm. tenured professors tend not to code much anymore. They tend not to really do much of their own research anymore. <laughs> I can confirm uh, that. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are, there are, um, that's not true of everybody. Like you look at guys like yeah. Jan LeCun and Joshua Bengio and Jeffrey Hinton, like there's a reason that they're well known because yeah. they keep doing high quality work, you know. Um, and uh, like you look at Jan LeCun, he's he's spending plenty of time coding and trying new ideas. And um, yeah, so whereas to me, I'm kind of like, uh, okay, I I have a particular problem I want to solve. Sometimes it's it's like I want to win this competition. So like with mm -hmm. the Stanford Dawn Bench competition, they were like, okay, uh, we had gave ourselves a specific goal, which was can we train uh, ImageNet within 12 hours? Yeah. Um, so that was like a problem we wanted to solve because we basically wanted to say to people, hey, you don't have to be Google scale to do something like training ImageNet from scratch. Um, Sometimes it's um, kind of driven by, well, like recently I wanted to show people how to do um, medical imaging analysis really easily. So I created five cackle kernels about the RSNA brain hemorrhage competition. And so my research there was like, how do I make each step of this so simple that I can create a single small cackle kernel that anybody can understand with no prerequisites, you know? Um, Sometimes it's uh, the research is kind of starting from a point of saying, um, why doesn't idea X work in domain Y? So, for mm -hmm. example, at a couple of places that's been used as a oh, lot transfer learning. You know, we, that that's how we did the ULM fit. It's like, why doesn't transfer learning get used in NLP? Yeah, that's how we got the state of the art for segmentation. Why? Why are people using transfer learning and segmentation properly? Yeah. Uh, that is, um, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, that's how we developed with Jason Nogan. It's basically, mm -hmm. yeah. why can't we use transfer learning for image generative modeling? Um, so sometimes it's like a certain amount of bloody mindedness of saying like, okay, this method ought to work in this domain. Mm -hmm. And everybody says it doesn't, but it should. So let's keep <laughs> on hammering at it until we get it get it to work. How do you continue building the forty nine models when only the fiftieth works? So because it, as as you quoted it, nothing works in machine learning until it does. I don't know. Like to be clear, I hate I hate 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 doing machine learning. I hate talking <laughs> models. Um, I really enjoy writing software, like uh, normal software, but I hate training models because for the reason you spe specify. It's like, not only does nothing work, but you get no feedback about why it doesn't work or what you could do to make it work. Like, um, so, you know, for me, I kind of come back to my, to my intuition maybe intuition is not quite the right word. It's like not formally proving things, but knowing enough about how the Two things things. work to know that it ought to work, you know? And so if it's not working, part of it's like saying like, okay, it's not working. The very act of finding out why it's not working should of itself lead to interesting insights. Um, so maybe let's not set my sights as high as saying, let's make this work. Maybe it's like, let's just set my sights as, as high as saying like, let's learn why it doesn't. Because if something doesn't work, there's a reason. 99% of the time when something doesn't work is because I have some stupid bug. Um, but it's really hard to find that stupid bug in machine you know, learning space. So much code, which is why I'm so ruthless about refactoring. Like I'm trying to, reduce the amount of code and 
not just removes the amount of code, but reduce the amount of code that I have to write to train a model, because that's less code that I could screw up. So the more stuff I can automate, um, the less stuff that there is for me to think about when I have the inevitable moment where nothing's working and I have to figure out why. <laughs> but so, it requires uh, a lot of tenacity. Yeah. Andres Turubia asked from the AMA section, uh, how does FASTA team find these obscure papers like Leslie Smith's uh, learning rate finder? Um, mainly from Twitter. Um, I don't qu quite remember where I first came across Leslie Smith. Oh, I guess, um, so that was, yeah. So originally it was the uh, cyclical learning rate, which was less obscure. There were people talking about cyclical learning rates. And the LR finder, I think, was in that paper, but was the kind of slightly ignored part. So part of the trick is to actually read the damn papers, not mm -hmm. just the summaries and people's blog posts. It's like, read the paper. They're, they're actually often better written than one might expect. Like they're often, they you know, actually have the, a better explanation of what's going on than anybody's blog post. Um, I also look for um, competition winning approaches. So like particularly academic competitions generally have workshops mm -hmm. where the competition winning approaches are discussed. And generally those workshops don't have normal, like even archive preprints. They normally have a special like workshop website where the people's talks will be specifically uploaded as slides. And those have often have much more interesting detailed content than any paper does. Cool. So kind of, yeah, competition workshops are really, really good. And then you can see like, what do they cite? And just kind of get more information about some of the basic ideas. Um, things like archive sanity are good because you can see like other papers that are similar. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think I, th I think if you're careful about following people on Twitter, you can get the best kind of starting point from Twitter. And particularly if when you see something interesting on Twitter, um, like you can then again look to see what it cited and see what's citing it, and look at archive sanity and get in a whole new rabbit hole. Okay. Um, yeah, it's kind of it's pretty easy to get started on Twitter. Like you can, like you can just see all the people I follow, for example, and start following the same people, and now you'll be seeing the same papers that I see. There's no, uh, yeah, there's no secret to it. The recommender engine, in my opinion, is very helpful in that sense. Whatever is getting retweeted comes up at the top. So in the top yeah. ten tweets, you can't miss it. Yeah, absolutely. Coming back to the fast A library, can you tell us what amount of efforts do you invest into that? And now the third rewrite is happening. Uh, so can you t tell us more about the research and the uh, software experience that goes into yeah. it? So Silva and I have been working on that pretty much entirely full time since the last course finished. Um, and uh, it's the first time we've, you know, decided not to have a deadline. So we don't have a course this, this half year for that reason. Yeah. We decided no deadline. Let's write everything as, as well as we can, take as much time as we need and make it the very best we can. So um, that's been super fun. Because as I say, I hate training models, so I haven't been training many <laughs> models at all for <laughs> the last six months. <laughs> I just love writing software, so that's been good. Uh, and it's been really nice to take the time to do it as well as we can. And uh, we both feel pretty proud of what we've we've built because it's like every piece is the best we can make it. So we, you know, the documentation system is really good. Uh, you know, we've built a new tool for generating Python modules, uh, libraries from Jupyter Notebooks, which we love using. Uh, it's got its own testing built in. It's got its own documentation development built in. 
we've created our own type dispatch system um, for Python, which we There's love. There's a book we've also read. coming out that I can't wait to read. Yeah, yeah. So we're writing. So once we finish the 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 library, we can work on the book, which um, we're kind of starting to get back into now. Um, originally, we were planning to write the book for version one, but then when we realized how much better version two would be. We just thought that it would be stupid to write the book for version one. So we kind of had okay. to say to O'Reilly, please wait six months while we write new <laughs> software. Okay. Which they were very understanding. Um, so yeah, FastAI v2 is uh, entirely, re entirely written from scratch. The, the highest level of the APIs looks super similar and familiar compared to v1. But underneath, nothing looks familiar. Like okay. rather than this kind of ugly mess of thousands of lines of code, it's a really delightfully layered API and it's really, really enjoyable to work with. Can you tell us more about how you and Sylvain collaborate? Uh, so how does your common workflow and your distribution of tasks look like? Yeah, I mean, it helps that Sylvain is just a super patient and nice person and uh, is also incredibly competent. So. Um, what tends to happen quite a lot is I'll kind of say to him, okay, I think we should build X, you know, and we seem to have pretty similar tastes. So most of the time when I do that, he'll say like, oh, that sounds fantastic. And, uh, he'll go and build X and then I'll kind of look at it and I'll be like, uh, okay, that does what I said I'd like it to do but the way it does it is not great. You know, it's like, yeah. I don't know, has this issue or that issue. And so at that point, you know, I tend to kind of take over. And so the thing that he spent six hours making it work, I'll then spend three weeks refactoring it, mm -hmm. um, which for me is just this very slow iterative process of, of continual dissatisfaction until eventually I get to a point where it's like, okay, this doesn't suck too much, so good. Um, and that's kind of tends to work out nicely because often Sylvain will then look at the result and be like, oh, that's much nicer than I had imagined we could do. And you know, so we both end up happy. Um, although partly that's because like he didn't have as much experience of designing APIs as I had. And so in the last few months, he's actually been getting a lot better at that. So you know, uh, increasingly he's building stuff which I don't throw away <laughs> and rewrite <laughs> based on his, you know, tests and stuff. Um, the other thing is like Silva is super smart, so he can keep a lot of stuff in his head at once. Um, so he tends to write things which Silva can understand, whereas I'm okay. like, you know, 50 lines of code in and I've forgotten what the first line of code said. <laughs> so I kind of need to refactor things until they're simple. Um, but, you know, overall, um, you know, he's in New York, I'm in San Francisco. Um, although we, you know, increasingly we're spending more and more time pairing. So sometimes we'll pair for two or three hours a day, um, particularly on stuff that neither of us quite feel we know what we want it to look like. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I really like pairing, you know, it's, it's a great way to, um, I, I think we both feel like we, we end up more productive by spending a fair bit of time pairing. Um, other than that, we're generally just like texting back and forth on Skype a little bit. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's a good collaboration. I really enjoy it. Got it. Now coming to the course. Uh, so the course has certain versions, uh, as you call it, but each version has sort of these embedded really nuggets, what we call uh, things Jeremy says to do. So what's your recommendation on how to take the course? Should we take the latest? Should we wait for the next version of the library? Because that's, as we expect with fast, it will be better than the current version. Yeah, you should never wait, you know, because the, um, uh, you know, as you know, like the, the, the part one practical deep learning, it, doesn't really change that much in terms of like the things that you're meant to be getting out of it is a, a an understanding of what's going on and 
how to debug things and what are the key steps and stuff like that. Uh, each year we we teach more than the previous year by leveraging the software, which gradually gets better and better. But, uh, you know, a lot of people who, uh, like you, who watch one version will watch all the following versions as well because each, like, but you get faster and faster, so it takes less and less time. So, yeah, I would say never, never wait for the next one to come along. In terms of uh, programming advice, so the one year of software experience, uh, because I figured this that I was really bad at it when I started, what advice do you have? How should we prepare for that one year of uh, surrogate experience? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely the biggest difference between, you know, maybe one of the two biggest differences between really competent practitioners and everybody else is coding skills. Um, it, which, but it's entirely about practice really um, so using something like a Jupyter notebook and uh, following along with kind of all the assignments in the course I mean that's just a good that's just a good way to learn uh, like mm -hmm. I try to I try to demonstrate practical coding approaches in the course yep. um, so and I try particularly in v2 to Uh, the the implement into you know a kind of a role model for a nice way to implement things, so like yeah it's not a bad way to get better at coding it's just um, and a lot of people are doing this now is to kind of get deeper and deeper into the fast AI code yourself but spend more and more time creating models and looking into them and tuning them and changing them and then seeing how they're implemented um, it's all yeah it's all practice. Got it. That's one of the most liked co uh, quotes, I think, from part two, fast.ai, come for deep learning, stay for software engineering. Yeah. So that definitely yeah. goes to that. Yeah, and I mean, I'm, I have a lot more experience now as a coder than as a machine learning person, really. Like my kind of real deep machine learning study started with Kaggle, so like <laughs> less than 10 years ago. Um, uh, I feel like I have more expertise on on coding to share. And also because I, you know, my whole working life have spent uh, half, at least half of every day practicing and learning new things, much of which has been coding. So I've kind of tried a lot of languages and a lot of approaches and stuff like that. So I, yeah, I definitely feel I have a lot of uh, coding ideas to to share. Got it. So coming to how you spend the half of half of your day, you've made an explicit uh, promise to spend 12 hours a day learning something new. What do you usually do in those hours? Is it reading papers? Is it related to machine learning? Totally unrelated? Well, it's, half, it's half of each working day. So it's more like four hours. Um, okay. I mean, mainly, so that's been since I was like 18. So it's like 28 uh, years ago or something. Um, um, it's really like when I have some project to complete that day, I just try to think about like, okay, well, how could I complete that in a way that I also try out a language I haven't tried yet or a method I haven't tried yet, or I could build a new library to automate some part of that or, well, something like that, you know? So it's really nearly entirely about, um, doing an actual project um, using something new. So for example, uh, this weekend, um, I had to send out 3,000 emails. So okay. I, I wrote a new uh, email sending package, which I just put on GitHub. Um, <laughs> and it was like, OK, I will try to learn more about how good ways to send emails in Python. Again, going back to your practical way of approaching uh, problems. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, over time, um, although you're kind of, in some ways, spending half of each day, at least, kind of being maybe less productive because you're not using the thing you already know, over a period of, you know, years, that that time, you're 
becoming potentially orders and orders and orders of magnitude more productive. Yeah. Um, so it, like you get this kind of exponential learning on learning, building up, scaling effect, which um, yeah means I do find now that uh, I, I um, most times when I'm sitting next to somebody doing some piece of work, I can do it faster than everybody else that's around me just because I kind of have this, you know, kind of skills built on skills, built on skills thing now. Yeah. Got Particularly it. like as people get older, like normally as people get older, they get worse and worse because they spend less and less time <laughs> practicing technical skills and they learn less and less things and they spend more and more time telling other people what to do, which yeah. is a real shame. Generally speaking, how uh, how has the approach of how you learn machine learning changed over the years? Do you also use space repetition for machine learning or what approaches do you no, use? No, I don't. I only use space repetition learning for language learning. Um, okay. Because I, um, so because I'm, you know, been learning Chinese, but I'm not in China and I'm not speaking to Chinese people. So I'm not having that chance to practice. So I need something to keep it fresh. Um, or else my approach to learning conceptual things is as much as possible just to, to use it. Um, mm -hmm. So if I'm learning a new language, I'll just try and write lots of things in that language. Um, so I don't, yeah, I don't find there to be any benefit to me in spaced repetition for kind of those kinds of technical topics because I just don't find myself needing to I don't know, look stuff up in the documentation about like how to write a loop or something because I've got it. been doing it every day. Um, so coming now to the course material, uh, can you for once give us a hint of what is the homework we can do with Fast Air? Because there's always this question, it's an open-ended question. What's your best suggestion to go with the materials? I mean, I'm not sure I'm the best person to ask. It's probably you would be better <laughs> placed because I, you know, I do a lot of homework for each course, which is I write every one of those notebooks and I try lots and lots of different things to figure out what to write. And so by the end of it, I feel like I'm pretty competent in that topic. So, <clears throat> I mean, the biggest efficiency of the course at the moment is it does rely on people being very proactive, uh, kind of self-guided learners, you know, like you are, because, um, yeah, we don't say like, answer this quiz, get this score, here's this certificate. You know, it's more like we're relying on your passion and interest to do projects and solve problems. Um, so for me, um, I mean, there's lots of good advice, I think, on the forum, but generally like, okay, if you can uh, try to create something that's pretty similar to the notebook, um, yeah. from scratch without peaking as much as possible is, is good. That can get pretty boring, you know, so maybe make it based on some other data set you're interested in. Um, um, I think it's also a case of knowing, like, which bits do you find hard, you know? Mm -hmm. So if, if the coding is easy for you, but understanding the insights about like, why do we put batch norm here? Or why do we use a three by three conv there? Or why is there a stride two here? Then maybe you should spend more of your time. Like maybe you don't really understand the basic layers and their inputs and outputs yet. So maybe you could create a little quiz for yourself where you look at an input and a convolutional kernel and try to guess what size tensor is going to come out. Or, you know, you kind of, okay. there's this concept of deliberate practice from the kind of the, the learning research community and deliberate practice is all about practicing the things which you find hard. Um, that, 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 you know, practice doesn't make perfect. 10,000 hours does not make you an expert, but <laughs> 10,000 hours of deliberate practice um, can. So mm -hmm. it's a case of like, yeah, finding the stuff that, that you need to work on and then finding a way to study that, test yourself on that, apply that uh, in a way that's going to keep you engaged. Because the main problem is that most people don't stay engaged. 
So rather than trying yeah. to think about the optimal, perfect learning thing, try to instead focus on the thing that's going to keep you the most engaged so that you don't give up. I think, uh, so speaking personally, how I've gotten just slightly better at these projects is through the community because there's always this great set of small icons that get very active every six months and they're always kind with the advices. And one of the best advices I get is Kaggle. What's your current take on Kaggle? Do you think the competitions are still worth jumping on? Uh, I know you highly recommend it through the courses. What yeah, gaps so much so. So much so. I mean, I... Um... So I just did a deep dive on this RSNA competition, um, which is only the second computer vision competition I've really done on Kaggle. Um, mm -hmm. The other one being the Planet one, which is a couple yeah. of years ago now. Where the students beat you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was a really great learning exercise for me um, to you know, go up against the best practitioners in the world uh, because there's plenty of people, particularly academics, who are very dismissive of Kaggle and they have very good reason to be, right? Because a lot of them are imposters, you know, they don't actually know how to train models. And mm -hmm. so if they got on Kaggle, they would fail and then they would be found out that they actually, <laughs> they actually don't know what they're doing. Um, like there's lots of things to successful machine learning projects, but one of them is to actually be good at building predictive models that predict things. <laughs> and yeah. so, um, <laughs> and so, 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 so many people in research and teaching can't do that, but the people on Kaggle can. And so it's really great to see, you know, to, to, to work hard, to do the best you can and to see what works and what doesn't. Um, and it's really good for your software engineering because like if you do that for a whole three month period, you'll often see that your ability to maintain your solution falls apart as it gets more complex. Yeah. So that's a great way to learn software engineering skills. Um, it's a great way to learn about kind of reproducible experiment skills because you'll realize like, oh, that idea you had two weeks ago, you now can't replicate it and you don't know why nothing, anything's you know, not working as well anymore. And so you... Especially when you're in a team situation where you have to like send your code, uh, code across to another teammate who That's can't... True. Yep. Yep. I mean, I don't do much stuff with teams, but yep, I could certainly see that. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great exercise. And um, there's always so many competitions going on. Um, yeah. And also, like, it's a good opportunity for practicing your communication skills because um, you can try to create a kernel. And if you've created something with good content that you've clearly expressed, you'll be rewarded for it with yep. with upvotes. And if if not, if you don't get the upvotes, that's interesting of itself because it's like, okay, you your material was not received well by a totally independent, totally impartial jury in a very kind of clear transparent way and mm -hmm. it's this kind of like the transparent feedback of leaderboard scores and you know notebook upvotes is something you never get in a real job you know yeah. <laughs> you get this kind of bullshit feedback from a manager who doesn't actually understand what you're doing um so i think yeah it's it's a great great development experience so uh, another question that I personally have had faced is how do you recommend a fast year student to jump on Kaggle? Is it like in parallel with the material, which is what I still do or should they complete the course first, then jump on the leaderboard? I just fine, you know, whatever is more engaging for you, whatever is going to keep you coming back. So I would guess for most people doing them at the same time would be more engaging. Um, like definitely, the stuff you learn later in the course is going to help you. Um, but the stuff you learn later in the course, you won't really have the context to fully appreciate it until you've tried doing some things. Yeah. So, you know, you kind of have to come back and forth. Um, so this, this will be a tricky question. What, do you, what would be your maybe one or two favorite projects from the community that you really enjoyed? Um, 
I love um, Jason's Deodify project. Um, I think it's like, I was so excited about it that when I was preparing lesson seven, you know, I reached out to him and I said, hey, I've got some cool ideas about GANless generative models and you've been doing cool stuff with generative models based on the previous version of this course. Let's team up and see what we can build, you know? And uh, that's, he's now turning that into a startup, I think. And you can see he's getting these beautiful results of kind of colorization, both for movies yeah. and for images. And we even ended up teaming up and co-presenting at the Facebook conference along with uh, Yuri Manor from the Salk Institute. Um, so, you yeah, know, that's an example of a project where he has worked tirelessly and hard for a period yeah. of now about a year more, I guess, than a year. Um, and that's that kind of tenacity that's so important. Like he's just been single-minded in deciding to make the best, best thing that he can. Um, and he reads a lot of papers and he tries a lot of, a lot of things. Um, and he's generous with his sharing with the community. Um, and I think he's being recognized for that. And, you know, and yep. also he's not somebody who has a traditional machine learning academic background. Um, but he's a super good coder and um, turned into like the world's leading practitioner in this field, I think, based yeah. on his results. Um, would these actually projects, has, yeah. sorry, sorry. would these projects be act as a sort of surrogate for you, for example, if you were hiring at Jeremy Howard Company? Uh, would, would oh, yeah, be, I mean, they are. Like, I mean, they absolutely are. So I've... I've only hired one person at Fast AI, and that was still. <laughs> but was in terms of on, that was students. entirely on the basis, but that was entirely on the basis of his blog posts. So mm -hmm. he was a Fast AI student who wrote really, really, really good blog posts, um, showing deep understanding of the material and pushing it a bit further. And um, yeah, uh, so that's that's what I care about. Is, Definitely more on the self-taught versus academic. I don't care how you're taught. You know, I just care what you've, what you've built, you know, like what you do. Um, I think, like, if you've done a PhD, you know, there's a significant downside there, which is you went to school, then you went and did an undergrad, and then you went and did your PhD. Like, you, you just kept on doing the same thing. You never had the interest in other <laughs> things to think like, what does the rest of the world look like? So like there's that in the downside on the upside, you know, you've stuck at something for a long time and you finished it. And it's something which is, you know, required some significant level of technical expertise, but there's definitely pros and cons to, to that. Um, by the same token, um, I don't know. For me, it's like it's all about what have you what have you done based on what opportunities have you had. So if you grew up in you know uh, rural Bangladesh, you know, with nothing but a ten year old computer and had no access to universities, and you nonetheless built this successful GitHub project, like to me, that's much more impressive than growing up in a family of professors and going to Stanford and getting a GPA, <laughs> you know. Again, one final question before we end the call is, is the bike in your Twitter cover profile the one that you ride to work every day or is that you in the picture? So that was actually in Australia when I was <laughs> lucky enough to be within riding distance of the Phillip Island track, which I think I haven't ridden that many places, but people say it's the best track in the world. So that was a three hour ride mystery sold three hour ride from my house <laughs> and uh so that was uh that was a bike i really liked it was uh um fast but still quite ergonomic for riding on the street there, there isn't actually any bikes around nowadays that are quite as nice nowadays i have a um triumph daytona 675 um, okay but i haven't really ridden it since uh my daughter came along my 
my parent brain has decided that the th thrill of potential death <laughs> is no longer as attractive as it used to be. Okay. Jeremy, thank you so much again for doing the interview and for thank you all for of your me. contributions to the Fast AI community and the machine learning community. And congratulations on your, all of your success and especially your recent job. Well done. Much deserved. Thanks so much. Thanks all so right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.